So all right, look with me, John 14. John 14, I'm going to start reading in verse 15. Let's talk about the era of the Holy Spirit. John 14, beginning in verse 15, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Those are awesome words. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you stranded as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will, show them, will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while I'm still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for the people that you love so much. And thank you for your powerful word, your word is truth. Father, I pray that each one of us would have a personal encounter with you as we receive the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. This past week we were on winter break. The kids were on winter break from school. So we took them to check out some Christian colleges in Oklahoma and Texas. Can't believe that we've already reached the stage where we're checking out colleges. Last weekend, we stayed with my cousin who lives in Tulsa, and we visited a Midwest megachurch on Sunday morning. The churches out there make harvest time look like a little tiny drop in the bucket. For seven years, Denise and I lived in the Midwest, and we attended big churches like that. But I have to tell you, after 23 years in Connecticut, we're not completely comfortable anymore. I said to my cousin, if I lived here again, I'm not sure I could go to a church this big. He grew up in Boston. He said, yeah, it took us a while to adjust to big. Here at HTC, we're in a season of adjusting to bigger. We're certainly not Oklahoma big, but our new sanctuary is triple the size of our old sanctuary. We have a new schedule of services on Sunday that takes some getting used to. We have many new friends who have joined us in our new home and they're getting used to us. So the Holy Spirit put it in my heart to do this new series called HTC, Who Are We? We have 16 statements of faith that unite us as a church family. If you're not familiar with all of those, out on the welcome desks on either side of the sanctuary doors, we have a printed piece that just reviews all 16 of our basic beliefs. We've been sharing about these over the last couple of weeks to introduce ourselves to friends who are new and also to remind ourselves of the beliefs that unite us. So HTC, who are we in this shiny new building? We believe in one true God, a personal God who longs to have a personal relationship with each one of us. We believe God has spoken. 
God has revealed to us what we couldn't discover on our own. God has made himself known to us in the Bible. We believe Jesus is Lord. Without ceasing to be God in any regard, Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, put on a body of human flesh and walked among us. We believe that people need the Lord. We live in a world that's dirty because of sin. And that's a problem because God is clean. We can't approach God with dirty hearts and with dirty hands. We need to be cleansed, but we can't cleanse ourselves. We believe that the cross is God's remedy for the problem of sin. On the cross, Jesus exchanged his innocent life for our guilty lives. He took upon himself the punishment that we all deserved. Pastor Kurt shared with us about the cross last week. Today, let's talk about how we believe that this is the era of the Holy Spirit. Looking at Jesus' words in John 14, I find seven truths that we believe about the Holy Spirit here at HTC, and I want to share them with you quickly. On your way in at the door, you might have received an outline uh, of today's sermon. And if you like, you can use that to follow along. You can watch the screens and listen and fill in the blanks and just stay engaged with us while we talk about seven truths that we believe about the Holy Spirit here at HTC. The first truth is this. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. In John 14, Jesus tells the disciples, I'm leaving. I'm going home to my Father. We're going to be physically separated for a while. But he says, don't be sad. I'm going to ask the Father to send another. In Greek, that word another is the word alos. It means another of the very same kind. The Holy Spirit is not heteros, another of a different kind. He is alos. He is another of the same kind. Beloved, along with the Father and the Son, there is another person in the Godhead. He is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just like the Father and the Son in every way. Just as the Father and the Son have always existed... The Holy Spirit has also always existed. Just as the Father and the Son have always existed in perfect, unbroken fellowship with one another, the Holy Spirit has also existed in perfect, unbroken fellowship with the Father and with the Son. Just as the Father and the Son are equally God, the Holy Spirit is also equally God. Just as the Father and Son share the same divine nature, the Holy Spirit also shares that same divine nature. Just as the Father and the Son participated in creation, the Holy Spirit also participated in creation. Let us make man in our image. Just as the Father and the Son have been active in salvation history, the Holy Spirit has also been active in salvation history. Just as the Father and the Son are divine persons, distinct from one another, the Holy Spirit is also a divine person, distinct from the Father and the Son. Beloved, this is very important. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a he. Nor is the Holy Spirit a she, by the way. John actually goes out of his way in John 14 to use personal pronouns in such a way that it emphasizes that the Holy Spirit is a he. Listen, Paul tells us in Corinthians, let's not go beyond what's written in the scriptures. We call the Holy Spirit a he because the Bible calls the Holy Spirit a he. That's good enough for me. The Holy Spirit is not some amorphous blob of energy that emanates from God. You know, sometimes we struggle to think of the Holy Spirit as a person because the Bible uses a lot of metaphors to describe the activity of the Holy Spirit. He is described as wind, as fire, 
as rain, as anointing oil, as a dove. There are many depictions of God the Father. There are many, many depictions of Christ the Son. But if you look for a depiction of the Holy Spirit, you will only find symbols that represent him. Indeed, Jesus says here in John 14, the world cannot see him and they don't know him. But beloved, it's important you understand the Holy Spirit is not just a force. He's not just a, a cosmic impulse or a manifestation of divine power. He has all the qualities of divine personhood, just like the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit thinks. He has emotions. He has a will. He has plans and purposes. He sees. He hears. He has a voice. He asserts himself. He relates to others. He knows others, and he can be known by them. He can be grieved, or he can be pleased. He can be resisted, or he can be received. The Holy Spirit is a proper object of our worship, just like the Father and the Son. We can relate to him in prayer, just as we do the Father and the Son. We can direct our petitions to the Holy Spirit, just as we do to the Father and to the Son. There is another of the same kind in the Godhead, the person of the Holy Spirit. HTC, who are we? Seven truths we believe about the Holy Spirit here at HTC. Second, this. The Holy Spirit is the second in a pair of cleats. The second in a pair of cleats. Jesus said, I'm going away. But don't be afraid, I am going to send you another advocate, another counselor, another teacher, another witness. The, the word in Greek is the word paraclete. How many of you know what a paradox is? Paradox is two doctors. I'm being punny here. A paraclete is two character witnesses that help us get a grip on God's identity. The Holy Spirit is actually the second paraclete sent into the world by the Father. The first paraclete was Jesus. Jesus is called in John, 1 John 2, verse 1, our paraclete. The Father sent Jesus into the world to be his spokesman. That's one meaning of the word paraclete. One meaning is a character witness. Someone credible that you ask to come to court to testify on your behalf. Jesus was the first credible witness, the first character witness who came to show us what the Father is like. He came to reveal to us the mercy, the love, the goodness of the Father. He came to reveal the will of the Father. He came to testify, testify about heaven and hell and the coming judgment. He came to open up the way to the Father. Jesus was the first paraclete. His mission was to help us get a grip on God's identity. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is another paraclete. He is a second of the same kind. So listen, the Holy Spirit has picked up where the ministry of Jesus left off. And the Holy Spirit's role is to continue that work of testifying about the Father that Jesus began. His role is to reveal the Father today. His role is to reveal the way to the Father opened up by Jesus. This era that we live in, the era between Christ's ascension and his second coming, is the era of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the agent of the Godhead that is most active in our world today. The Holy Spirit, listen, I like this. The Holy Spirit witness of the Father is just as powerful today as was Jesus' witness in Jesus' day. Just because the Holy Spirit came second in time doesn't mean that he's the second best at testifying about the Father. In fact, 
we could even respectfully say that the Holy Spirit's witness of God today is even more effective than that of Jesus. Why do I say that? Well, during Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus' witness was confined to those who could get within earshot of him. Jesus' witness of the Father was confined to the borders of Israel. It was confined to the range of his human voice and the reach of his human arm. You had to get within proximity of Jesus in order to receive Jesus' witness of the Father. But today, all over the world, the Spirit of God is moving. Jesus said in John 14, when the Holy Spirit comes, the witness of the Father will be even greater on the earth. You shall do greater works than you saw me do. I don't believe that Jesus meant greater in quality, but he meant greater in quantity. Isn't it wonderful that we don't have to go to Jerusalem to get a witness of the Father today? The Holy Spirit is at work in New York. The Holy Spirit is at work in Tulsa. The Holy Spirit is at work in Hawaii. He's at work in Indonesia. He's at work in Nepal. He's at work all around the globe this morning. HTC, who are we? Seven truths we believe about the Holy Spirit here at HTC. Number three, I like this one. The Holy Spirit is our divine paramedic. The Holy Spirit is our divine paramedic. That word paraclete, it means a character witness. A paraclete also means someone who's called to the rescue. A paraclete means someone who is called in to help you. Jesus said, if you love me and obey my commands, I will ask my Father to dispatch the helper to you. I won't leave you stranded. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit is our first responder. A couple of weeks ago, we were having a meeting with Pastor Charles about some exciting changes that are coming to our Stanford campus. During the meeting, the fire alarm went off in the building. Now, all through the construction of this building, we were accustomed to the fire alarms going off because of workmen doing various things around the building. And so when the alarm first went off, we all just sat there and carried on with our meeting. We didn't realize that a sprinkler pipe had burst in the phase one sanctuary and was pouring a thousand gallons of water a minute on the floor. Thankfully, the Greenwich Fire Department also got the alarm and they didn't carry on what they were doing. They got in their trucks and the first truck arrived about five minutes after the alarm went off. They not only helped us to shut off the water, but they had powerful pumps on their trucks that helped us to pump out all of the water. We want to thank you for your patience. Uh, things aren't quite ship shape in the old wing of the building and the sanctuary and the classrooms downstairs. Um, we're very grateful. We're getting all new carpeting in the whole facility on both floors. Uh, we're working with the insurance company right now and hope to have that work done before Easter. But thank you for your patience while we put everything back together again. But imagine how much worse it could have been if the fire department hadn't come right away. The Holy Spirit is our first responder. At the request of Jesus, the Father dispatches the Holy Spirit who rushes to our side and brings needed help to us. He is the EMTs. He's the fire department. He's the police department. He's the canine unit. He's the SWAT team. He's the hostage negotiation team. Pastor Kurt, he's the bomb diggity squad. He's the hazmat team. He's the National Guard, the Coast Guard, the Honor Guard. He's the cavalry riding to our rescue. He's the Navy SEALs, the Army Rangers, and the the green berets all rolled into one. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. If you need help, 
Help is on the way. There is a promise from Jesus resting over your life. I will not leave you stranded. I won't leave you stuck. I won't leave you alone. I won't leave you in trouble. I will come to you. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and to those who are crushed in spirit. spirit. He's, he's a present help in time of trouble and a shelter in a time of storm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, he's our divine paramedic, our first responder. HTC, who are we? Seven truths we believe about the Holy Spirit here at HTC. Number four, I like this one too. The Holy Spirit is the divine reinforcer of our faith. The Holy Spirit is the divine reinforcer of our faith. Actually, that English word comforter doesn't fit particularly well as a translation for paraclete anymore. To us, when we think of a comforter, we think of someone who soothes us, we think of someone who consoles us. But John Wycliffe was actually the first person who translated the Greek word paraclete to the English word comforter in the 14th century. And when he translated it to the word comforter, the word comforter meant something a little different than it means today. The word comforter meant a strengthener. Besides a soccer cleat, uh, besides a soccer shoe, uh, a cleat is a bracket that reinforces something, that strengthens something. Over at the Parsonage, I have an antique bookcase that's been in my family for over a hundred years, a lawyer's case. It was my grandmother's. She moved it from Philadelphia to Florida in 1974. Came back to Philly in 1991 and then it moved to Missouri with me in 1992. And then it moved to Greenwich, Connecticut in 96. From Windy Knolls in Greenwich, it moved to View Street. From View Street to Essex Road, finally from Essex Road to the Parsonage here on King Street. And in all that moving, that old antique bookcase became wobbly. So I took it to someone who repairs antique furniture, and he said, here's your problem. He said, the wood glue has dried out, and the cleats inside the bookcase have come off. And so he re-glued the wood cleats back inside and my bookcase doesn't wobble anymore. It has been reinforced. It has been strengthened. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are a pair of cleats. They come alongside of us and they strengthen us. They come alongside of us and they reinforce us. They fortify our faith in God. They bolster our confidence in Him. They boost our courage. They stiffen our spiritual spines. They reinforce our resolve to follow Jesus. I don't know whether you ever feel this way, but sometimes when I read the Gospels, I, I feel like it was a lot easier for the 12 disciples to follow Jesus. Do you ever read the Gospels and feel that way? John, John said, we saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. We, we heard him with our own ears. Uh, I think about that and, and it seems like it would be so much easier to believe. It, it seems that, that seeing Jesus would make it so much easier to toe the line. It, it would make it so much easier for me to den deny myself on a daily basis and pick up my cross and follow him in living the crucified life. But listen, Jesus said the same strength, the same reinforcing, the same staying power that he gave to his disciples, the Holy Spirit gives to me now. In Ephesians 3, Paul said, I pray that you will be strengthened 
reinforced. I pray that you would be fortified. I pray that you would be bolstered in your innermost being with the strength that comes from who? The Holy Spirit. So that you would be rooted and established and have power to grasp a hold of the love of God. The Holy Spirit is the divine reinforcer of our faith. HTC, who are we? Seven things we believe about the Holy Spirit here at HTC. Number five. You ready for number five? You doing all right this morning? Get you anything? Can I get you a latte or a cookie, something? You know, can I have Napo bring you a lavender latte from downstairs? All right. You ready for number five? The Holy Spirit is God with us permanently. Jesus said, I'm going away, but don't you be afraid. I will ask the Father to dispatch another paraclete to be with you forever. I love those words. I will not leave you stranded as orphans. I will come to you. Three roles of the Holy Spirit in John 14. First of all, the Holy Spirit assures me that God is my Father and I am His child. Paul calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Daddy, dear Daddy. The Holy Spirit lavishly pours the love of God into our hearts. He gives us the assurance that God belongs to us and we belong to him. He gives us assurance of the width and the length and the breadth and the depth of God's unquenchable love for us. Beloved, can I tell you, when we realize that God loves us as a father, it changes everything. It changes the way that we approach him. And it changes the way that we approach others. It makes us secure. It makes us confident. It makes us free to be open to others. We used to sing an old chorus back in the day. I'm set free to love you. I'm able to love you because Christ loves me. It makes us hopeful. It makes us courageous. As an old man, John was still in awe of it all. He said, behold, what kind of love is this? that we should be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Holy Spirit is God with us permanently. Second role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy, I like this one. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus just as real to me as when Jesus was physically on the earth. The Holy Spirit gives me the inner assurance that Jesus is here with me now. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. The world won't see me anymore, but you will see me. How will we see him? By the person of the Holy Spirit. The world cannot see or know the Holy Spirit, but you will because he lives with you and he will be in you. When I was eight years old, my mother took me to a service at a little Pentecostal church that was in full-blown revival. I'd never been in a church like that before. The church that we attended as a family was a, a good church, but it was a very um, uh, liturgical, very, very quiet, solemn kind of church. And after that first service at that little Pentecostal church, I went home as an eight-year-old boy on my bed. I prayed a prayer. I said, God, I want everything you have for me. In that moment, the presence of the Holy Spirit came into my room, started pushing down on me like a warm, heavy weight. As a little boy, I was scared of everything. I was scared of the dark. I was afraid there were monsters under my bed, in my closet. I, I struggled tremendously with fear. I struggled to, to go to bed at night because I had so much fear, but when that warm heavy presence came and started pushing down on me I wasn't afraid it was so beautiful it was in fact honestly I remember lying there very still not wanting to move because I was afraid if I moved it would go away and I didn't want it to go away 
And all of a sudden I began worshiping God in a language that I had never learned before. Next week we're going to talk about the experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the beautiful gift of speaking in other tongues. And it is a beautiful gift. All I can tell you is that the presence of the Lord came to me in that moment. That was 44 years ago. I'm 52 now. And I have felt the presence of God with me every day of my life from that moment to this moment. The, the Holy Spirit makes Jesus' presence just as real to me as if we were walking the shores of Galilee together. Hey, he makes Jesus' presence just as real to me as if I were sitting at Jesus' feet listening to him teach. He, he makes Jesus' presence just as real to me as if I were sitting at table with Jesus leaning on his chest in the upper room. And here's the cool thing. I, I don't hear his voice outside of my head like the disciples did. I hear his voice inside of my head. I, I don't feel his touch on my shoulder. I, I feel him in the depth of my being. I don't see the smile on his face, but his smile shines on my face. We have something better than John the Baptist or anyone who ever lived before him. Jesus said John was the greatest among men, but he said even the least in the kingdom is greater than John because we have something that they never had, the beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. Third role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ushers us into the divine fellowship of the Godhead. John 1 tells us that from eternity past, God existed in a perfect, unbroken circle of fellowship. God was perfectly complete in himself. He was a perfectly content party of three, in perfect harmony with himself, in perfect agreement, in perfect intimacy. God did not create us because he needed us. God created us because he wanted us, and he created us to bring him glory. The astounding thing about the incarnation is that God became something substantively that he previously was not. If you think about that, it'll blow your brain. And on the cross, a perfect eternity of unbroken fellowship was shattered. Beloved, can I tell you, the cross cost God far more than we could ever realize. Far more than the excruciating human suffering that Jesus endured. God himself was wounded on the cross. He who lives in unapproachable light was pierced through by his own creations. God himself experienced the pain of separation that comes as a result of sin. The author of life tasted death. And he did all of that so that he could welcome us into his circle of fellowship. That is an amazing, profound, sublime thought. In John 14, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will realize that I am in my Father, and now you are in me, and I am in you. If anyone loves me, he'll obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come, and we will make our home with him. What an amazing, profound thought that is, that God ha has opened up the circle of his divine fellowship to welcome us into it. The Holy Spirit is God with us permanently. Don't be afraid. I'll ask the Father to dispatch another paraclete to be with you forever. HTC, who are we? Seven truths we believe about the Holy Spirit. Number six. I like this one. The Holy Spirit is our professor of practical theology. The Holy Spirit is our professor 
of practical theology. When you study theology formally, it's broken into several different categories. There is biblical theology, there is systematic theology, there is historical theology, and there is practical theology. Practical theology is applied theology. It's the teaching of the Bible applied to real life. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit helps us to do. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. Just like Jesus came to reveal the truth about God, the Holy Spirit carries on that work of revealing truth today. The Holy Spirit gives us inner assurance about what is right, what is true, what is holy, what is good. The Holy Spirit is the voice that we hear behind us saying, this is the right way. Walk in it. The Holy Spirit gives us an innate ability to discern between truth and deception. One of my favorite preachers used to say, he helps us know in our knower. He gives us the an inner ability to recognize, yes, this is good or danger. Stay away from that. Jesus says, second, that the Holy Spirit reminds us of everything Jesus taught. This reminding is not the ability to recite all the words of Jesus verbatim. This reminding is the supernatural ability to apply the words of Jesus in every situation we face. The Holy Spirit gives us on-the-spot wisdom to act in a manner that's consistent with all the teaching of Jesus. In every crisis, I know what would Jesus do, and I know what to do. In every conflict, I know what would Jesus do, and I know what to do. It, when I'm at home, I know what Jesus would do, and I know what I should do. When I'm at work, I know what Jesus would do, and I know what I should do. When I'm on Facebook, I know what Jesus would do, and I know what I should do, and I better do it. Jesus says something interesting in verse 21 of John 14. He said, the one who loves me has my commands. Beloved, when you're in love with Jesus, you intuitively keep his commands. When, when you're in love with him, it's innate. It's inside of you. That's the key to understanding the Sermon on the Mount. That was the response of Zacchaeus when Zacchaeus jumped down from the tree. He instinctively went the extra mile and repaid all those whom he had cheated. He imposed the, the stiffest penalty on himself under the law for cheating others. That's the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. Beloved, listen, don't let your conscience be your guide. Your conscience is corrupt because of sin. There is another guide. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of you telling you how you ought to act, what you ought to do, what you ought to say, how to be consistent with the teaching of Jesus in every situation. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. Now that doesn't mean that you know everything God knows. But it means the Holy Spirit will help you know everything you need to know when you need to know it. You know, sometimes we tell our kids you're on a need-to-know basis. You don't need to know. There are some things that you don't need to know that God knows. But what you do need to know, God will help you know it when you need to know it. I am that I am means I am everything you need. And the Holy Spirit teaches us everything we need for life and godliness. This was the spirit of supernatural wisdom that rested on Daniel in Babylon. God gave Daniel supernatural ability to learn. You know, we pray that over our kids here at HTC all the time, every week, we pray that the same grace that was on Daniel and the three Hebrew children will be on all of our kids at harvest time. That God will give them a supernaturally enhanced ability to learn and that they'll be the cream of the crops. We also pray continuously for full free ride scholarships to the best schools for all of our kids. So when your scholarship comes through, just say thank you, Jesus, for that. 
God gave Daniel supernatural wisdom. He gave him wisdom for health and fitness. He, he gave him wisdom to make decisions in the crisis. You know that Daniel was the king's go-to guy. Every time there was a, a, a crisis that the king couldn't resolve, he went to Daniel, and Daniel always had the answer. Why did he have the answer? Because he got it from the Holy Spirit. Most of us are familiar with Dr. Ben Carson, renowned neurosurgeon, now the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. The book Gifted Hands shares his life story. He was raised by a single mom in an at-risk environment, but his mom prayed for him from the time he was an infant. He made it into university. Eventually, he made it through med school, and Ben Carson shares about one season in particular where he was struggling tremendously with the amount of material and the complexity of the material in med school. He had an exam coming up, and he was uh, terribly nervous about the exam. He studied and studied and finally the, the night before the exam came he shut his light out and went to sleep and in the middle of the night he had a dream and in the dream an angel was at a chalkboard all night going over problems and going over material with him and helping him to solve equations, showing him solutions. When he went for the exam the next morning, the exact problems that the angels showed him in the night were the problems that were on that exam that day and he passed with flying colors. How many of you believe that God can do that? The Holy Spirit can give you the wisdom that you need exactly when you need it. Beloved, listen to me. It's, it's time that we start listening to that little voice inside of us. It's the Holy Spirit trying to remind us and help us how to, to know how to act consistently with the teachings of Jesus. When I was in Bible school, I was selected one weekend to travel with our Bible school president representing our school. We had a, a whole series of services lined up. And uh, we had classes the, the morning that we left for our trip. We had classes. And so our Bible school, there was a group of three of us, and our Bible school president said, uh, put your bags in my garage and then meet me after your last class. So I, I had a small suitcase, and I put it in the garage, and I had a garment bag on a hanger and I, I hung it from a, a rung on the ladder. When we got out of classes, uh, our Bible school president met us. The car was already loaded. The trunk was closed. The garage door was shut. And uh, something, something told me to look in the garage. But I, I didn't look in the garage. And we drove about six hours to our first destination. And when we got there, my little suitcase was there, but my garment bag was not there. I didn't have a suit to wear. And back in those days, 30 years ago, that was a problem. And so I was a 19-year-old kid, and I had to wear the suit of my 62-year-old Bible school president to the services all weekend. And it didn't look so good. And, uh, and I, I said to him, I said, something told me to look in the garage. He had a raspy old voice from decades of preaching. And he said, ah, Brother Harvison, Maybe next time you'll listen to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Beloved, it's time that we start listening to the Holy Spirit. It's time that we start listening to that voice of God inside of us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. He is our professor of practical theology. HTC, who are we? Seven truths we believe about the Holy Spirit here at HTC. Believe it or not, we're at number seven, Pastor Nick. Come and help us, worship team, if you would. Number seven, the Holy Spirit is the executor of our inheritance of shalom. The Holy Spirit is the executor of our inheritance of shalom. John chapter 14 opens with the words of Jesus saying, do not be afraid, and it closes with the words of Jesus saying, do not be afraid. And Jesus leaves us with an inheritance of peace. Jesus says, my peace I bequeath to you. The peace that Jesus has willed to us 
is the shalom of God. Shalom means nothing is missing and nothing is broken. The, the peace that the world gives is circumstantial. It's happiness that's contingent upon happenings. But shalom, shalom is something completely different from that. Shalom is the wholeness of personhood that comes from walking in a relationship with God. Shalom is inner security from God. It's confidence from God. It's inner fulfillment that comes from God. It's perfect masculinity for men and it's perfect femininity for women. It's mental health. It's emotional stability. It's volitional resolve. It's relational health. This shalom is the inner security that enabled Jesus to become a servant and to wash his disciples' feet. The Bible says on the night that Jesus was betrayed, knowing that the Father had given everything into his hand, Jesus took a towel and he knelt down and he became a servant. You see, it's, it's that kind of inner strength and inner confidence. It's that kind of identity that comes from God that enables us. We don't have to puff ourselves up or build ourselves up or make ourselves big because our security comes from Him. The wholeness that Jesus Himself walked in on the earth, He has bequeathed to us. My peace I bequeath to you my mantle of security, my inner confidence, my inner wholeness I bequeath to you. And the executor of that inheritance of peace is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit oversees the distribution of Jesus shalom to me on a daily basis so that every day of my life the Holy Spirit ensures that there is nothing missing and there is nothing broken inside of me. Do not be afraid. If you love me, you will do what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will dispatch another paraclete to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. He lives with you. He will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Peace I bequeath to you, not as the world gives. My peace I give to you, so you shall not Live in fear. HTC, who are we? Seven things we believe about the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity. The second in a pair of cleats. Our divine paramedic. Our divine reinforcer. God with us permanently. Our professor of practical theology. And the executor of our peace. Would you stand on your feet and give the Holy Spirit a great big praise in this place this morning. Oh, come on. Let's give him a good praise.